need to give you some background of how some of this came about. And I want to take a few minutes so that you understand some of the struggles that I went through as we tried, as, as I faced the issue of the return of Christ, the blessed hope. Titus 2.13 says, the blessed hope to every believer is the second coming of Christ. In 1985, I was involved with a committee of men to do a doctrinal statement for what turned out to be a college, a seminary, a mission board, a little church, and a great big church. And there were three of us. And we went through every detail. And to me, I don't only want to say this is what we believe. I want to be able to defend it. That's very important to me. And over the years, I've taken one topic at a time, and I've tried to develop it and put it together so that I could understand it. Of course, because eschatology, or the study of future things, is always on the bottom because it's the last, so they always make it the last point, I was in good shape until I came down to the position on the return of Christ. Now, very frankly, I have a very logical, literal mind, and that always confused me. I would talk to my friends about it. I'd say, show it to me. And, and, and the, the, the statement we were taking did this. Now, follow what I'm going to say. This is important. This is important. The book of Revelation, if it's studied, the first five chapters basically deal with a warning to seven churches. And then they take you into the throne room of God. And they show the preparation for what happens in chapter 6 to chapter 19. A very natural way to follow the book of Revelation is this way. The book of Revelation begins and it talks about seven seals that Christ opens from a scroll because he is the only one counted worthy to do it. And with each of these openings, you see something occurring upon earth. The four horses of the apocalypse that we've heard about are the first four seals. Death, war, famine, tribulation. Then we move to the seven, the angels, and angels blow trumpets, and seven different judgments upon earth with trumpet judgments. And each time that the angel blows the trumpet, there's a tremendous judgment upon earth. And then it moves to seven bowls, and every time a bowl is poured out, another judgment comes upon earth. And it all climaxes in a thing that we call Armageddon, which we find in chapter 19 of Revelation. Now, today, if you hear the word tribulation, what they're talking about is Revelation 6 to Revelation 19, from the first seal right to Armageddon. That's what they call the tribulation period. We shall see this morning that it is also called the 70th week of Daniel, a seven-year period of time when all of the events that are embraced in, from the first seal right to Armageddon, all of these events are all together, and they happen one right after another, or in some kind of combination. So this seven-year period today has been termed the tribulation period. Seven years. Tribulation. You will very rarely hear me call it tribulation because the proper term is the 70th week of Daniel. I will come back to that later on. But the 70th week or seven years or tribulation period is all the same thing from the first seal right up to Revelation. Okay, you got me so far? Very important. A period of great distress upon the earth. You're going to see that. Now, the next thing is this. There are two views, two basic views in conservative biblical Christianity today. Two basic views. One view is that the church will be spared this entire seven year period. There's another view that says the church will go through it and will not be taken unto Christ until the end of the seven year period, okay? The one is called pre-tribulational rapture the other post-tribulational rapture. And there are some variations off of that, but very frankly, those are your two views. Pre-trib, post-trib. Pre-trib says we miss it all. 
post-trib says we go through it all. And very frankly, both of these positions are loaded with trouble. Great contradictions, loaded with trouble. Now, to give you an example, I'm quoting here, not myself, but I'm going to quote two men, both of which are the deans or past deans of very, very conservative seminaries that are known to be very strong pre-trib seminaries. One is Dr. John Walbert, who for 50 years was the dean at Dallas Theological Seminary, which is really the heart of the pre-trib. We miss all the problems. And, and uh, he says this in his book called The Rapture Question, which is probably the most pa popular book on the rapture written, 50, I think it was 1954 or 57. In his first edition, page 148, he says this. Now listen to me carefully. The fact is that neither post-tribulationalism, we go through it all, or pre-tribulationalism, we miss it all, is an explicit teaching of scriptures. The Bible does not, in so many words, state either. Did you hear that? The Bible doesn't state either. So if the Bible doesn't state either, what do we have? God's opinion or man's opinion? Man's opinion, right. He goes on to say the rapture question is determined more by your ecclesiology, your understanding of Israel and the church, more than it is your eschatology, your, your view of prophetic things. That's a very fair statement. Now, Dr. Richard Mayhew is the dean of Master's Seminary out in California, who is also strongly pre-trib. He says this in, on page 181 of the prophet's watchword, the day of the Lord, he says this, neither a pre-tribulation rapture nor a post-tribulation rapture is taught explicitly in the scriptures. Again, a leader in this view says neither is taught in scripture. Problems remain to be solved by the pre-tribulationists. Then he goes on, he says, but perhaps, now listen to this comment, perhaps the position of the pre-tribulationalism is correct, although its proof at times has been logically invalid or at least unconvincing. Logically invalid or at least unconvincing. May I ask you something, my friends? Does God expect us to hold something dearly to our heart that is logically unconvincing or, or logically invalid or at least unconvincing? Not, not my Bible. Not my Bible. I don't believe that. And two men of this stature, of two of the leading conservative seminaries in the country that hold this view to say it's not biblical, it's not scriptural, and that it's, what's that word again? It's logically invalid or at least unconvincing. That troubles me. Because to me, scripture should be clear on whatever it teaches. And how much more should it be clear on the blessed hope of every believer? My position is this. If God says the great hope is the second coming of Christ, it just seemed to my logic that it should be found on every page of the New Testament practically. Now, this is where I came from. And every doctrine that I hold dear, I have found that it's, it's, if it's for the church, it's found clearly in the New Testament. And it's not something I wonder, because if I'm not sure, then I should say I don't know. Now, I'm not here today to say I'm not sure. I will tell you, I believe what I'm going to say with all my heart, and I would die for it. I believe it's the most biblically provable issue that you will ever find in scripture. I believe that with all my heart. You've got to know that. And I know that it's an emotional issue. And I know that I will be labeled a heretic and a lot of other things because of the view that I'm going to explain to you today. But I'm asking you to do one thing. If you love God's word, I'm asking you to evaluate what I'm going to say by what God's word says, okay? Fair enough? And then I leave you to, be, to make the decision. I leave you to make the decision because what you're going to hear is something new, something that Marv Rosenthal calls the pre-wrath rapture of the church. The pre-wrath. It's not pre-trib. It's not post-trib. 
It's pre-wrath, and what it does, my friends, it takes all the problems out of both sides and make them all fit. Isn't that nice? Makes them all fit. Now that's the thing that you're going to see and it's exciting. I have probably, since I began my own study, close to 9,000 hours in this topic. It's a lot of time. Not only on this issue, but all of end time issues. And I hope that we're only going to talk about a little segment of this. But I'll tell you something else. Within the first three hours of my study, so that makes it 8,997 hours ago, I saw the pre wrath position. It's that simple. And as I've gone on, I've seen it all over Scripture. We're just going to talk about a few of those this morning. And I hope that, that, that it's as clear to you as it has been to me. And that's my desire. I know it has been to your pastor. Okay. Now, let me go back to my notes and see where I was going to go from here. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I almost forgot. Probably the biggest criticism of the pre-wrath position is not the position, but the man who is teaching it. Not the teaching, but the teacher. The typical criticism that you're going to hear is this. They say, well, tell me something, my friend. How come after 2,000 years, all of a sudden, Bob Van Campen or Marv Rosenthal have a corner on truth? And may I tell you something? That troubled me greatly. Because that bothers me. Because there is nothing special about Bob Van Campen or Marv Rosenthal. Nothing. Nothing. Zero. We don't have special revelation. We're not wired special. We don't get up and get visions. And that troubled me greatly. And about six weeks ago, and oh, I thank God for that. Six weeks ago, one of the writers in one of the books I was reading pointed me to a huge volume that I happened to have in my library. And I didn't know it was there. It just filled space. And it was called The Writings of the Antinician Fathers. Now, what does that mean? The last apostle died about 100 AD. Okay? The big council of the church, as the Nicaea Council, occurred 325 AD. And so for 200 years there, there was a period of time where the men that were taught by the apostles continued on in the church. And these men wrote what they believed. And the thinking is that if anybody should be close to what the original apostles thought, other than scripture, the church fathers, the Antinician church fathers should. And there's about 20 of them that they quote. May I tell you something? I've read them all, and I'll tell you, it's laborious. There is not one of these men, not one, that believed that the church was going to be taken before the 70th week. Not one. Not one. And everyone except two, and the two that didn't, became black sheep because they began to allegorize Scripture instead of taking it seriously. All the rest of them believed that the church was going to have to endure the persecution of Antichrist to refine it before the rapture of Christ would come, without exception. So when somebody says to me, who are you? I say, I'm nothing. You got an ax to pick. First of all, you pick it with Christ in the Olivet Discourse. Then you pick it with, with, second, with Paul in Second Thessalonians. And then you pick it with Revelation. And then you pick it with all the church fathers, but don't pick it with me. There's nothing new with what I'm saying. The position that I am teaching you, mark me, the position I'm teaching you is exactly the position that was taken by the church fathers. Okay? The second question I'm probably asked most often is, okay, big deal. What are you getting so excited about? Well, it bothers me when they say, what do you mean, what am I getting so excited about? I mean, we're talking about the second coming of Christ, aren't we? The blessed hope, right? And it's important whether we go through this time or not. What does it say in 1 Thessalonians? It said, be alert and be sober. 
you're not in the darkness that's going to catch you like a thief in the night. It says, be warned, be ready, okay? Now, but I'm going to tell you what bothers me. Now listen to me carefully. When Christ came the first time, there was a prophetic trigger that I believe with all my heart some of the men knew about. The prophetic trigger was that in Daniel, the ninth chapter, and we won't go into it because of time, but Daniel, the ninth chapter, verses 24 to 27, we have introduced to us a period of 490 years. It's called 70 weeks of seven, 490 years. He said this. He said, now 480 three years will occur from the time that the decree is given to rebuild the city until Messiah will be cut off by her people. Then he says, after you are scattered, it says, then there will be one final seven-year period in which I will come back together with you and I will deal with you. And that's the same seven-year period we've been talking about in Revelation, okay? The 70th week of Daniel. There is a book that's been written that has dealt very carefully with the time from when the decree was given by Artaxerxes in 445 B.C. on March 14th, who was of Persia, and he decreed to Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the city, and they have sat down and they have figured the difference between a lunar and a, and a solar uh, calendars, which the Jews worked under, and they have figured leap years and they have taken it. And you want to know something? The day that Christ rode into Jerusalem and was cut off by the people, rejected. Do you know how many prophetic years it was to the day? How many do you think? 483 exactly. Exactly to the day. I don't care what you think. God's word is that accurate. And I believe with all my heart that there were men that knew the time was close for that reason. I'm going to ask you another question. How many of you have know or have heard the spiritual that goes like this? The hip bone connected to the knee bone, the knee bone connected to the leg bone, the leg bone connected to the ankle bone, the ankle bone connected to the foot bone. Now hear the word of the Lord. Them bones, them bones gonna walk about, right? Do you know what? Is that a song? What does it mean? Do you know? I'm going to tell you. That bone is the greatest prophetic trigger to the second return of Christ. That song teaches you that before the last days, before Gog comes out of Magog, Meshach, and Tubal and begins the 70th week that we're going to see, Israel is going to come back into the land as a pile of dry bones. And they're going to reject their Christ, but they're going to become a nation again. Daniel 9.26 says there's no way that they can begin to take over until two things. The 70th week, they have to have the land back. That's number one. And number two, they have to have possession of the city. That's what it says in Daniel 9.24. 1948, the dry bones became together, began to come together. 1967, the dry bones got a control of Jerusalem. My friends, I will say one thing. I believe in my heart that we're dealing with something that we've never seen in the history of the church before. It can come together at any moment. Everything is in place because Israel's back in the land in unbelief as dry bones waiting to be breathed upon by God and come alive. But they won't do that until the end of the 70th week, not at the beginning because they go into the 70th week shaking their fist at God. Do we see that today? Should we be alert and sober as we see in 1 Thessalonians? Is that fair to say? Should we know more about, about the blessed hope? Should we not be sober and alert because the time is drawing nigh? I believe we should. I mean that. From my heart, I think it could happen in my lifetime and not my lifetime and my kid's lifetime. So on that basis, you've got to understand I feel it's important. I do not take it casually. I think it's very, very important to the person who says, who cares? I'm saying, my friend, you are in the dark. That day is going to come upon you as a thief in the night. See? 
That's my concern. Okay, with that as a background, we're ready to begin. So far, are you with me? Okay. You know, we got a seven-year period we talked about, and begins with the first seal, goes right to Armageddon, and it's called the Tribulation. It's also a seven-year period. It's called the 70th week of Daniel, and from here on, I'm going to call it the 70th week of Daniel because uh, you'll see why as we go along. It's never called the Trib. And the purpose today is to show you exactly what the church should be prepared for, why she's going to go through it, where she's going to be taken exactly. And I'm going to defend that to you. And I hope that when we're done, biblically, you will see it. But the first thing we have to talk about is a word called hermeneutics. Who here knows what hermeneutics means? Oh, two on the front row. Derek, we'll throw Derek in just in case. All right. If he can write a great song like that, he's got to know what hermeneutics means. Hermeneutics means interpretation. How do you understand what I'm saying? Now, the normal way is to understand what I'm saying, exactly what I'm saying. If I say, good morning, it's raining outside, it probably means it's in the morning and it's raining outside, right? Doesn't mean it's in the evening or it's some, it doesn't, it means what I say. Scripturally, my hermeneutic, and you've got to understand this, is I take scripture very naturally and very literally exactly for what it says. Is that too much to ask? And if someday I come up before Christ and he said, Bob, what do you think I meant by that? That, 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 that phrase, and I said, well, I just assumed it was morning, Lord, because you said good morning, and I assumed it was raining because you said it. And he says, oh, I got you. It's not what I meant at all. Then that's his problem, not mine. Because I believed him. You see? You must take Scripture naturally and literally for what it says. That's fair, isn't it? We do it every day. Now, we have a reason we can do that, and you've got to hear that reason. When you hear that reason, then you'll understand. Do you realize that there are 333 separate prophecies concerning the first coming of Christ? And do you know how those prophecies were fulfilled? Every one of them were naturally and literally fulfilled. How he would be born, where he would be born, what would happen to his life, how he would die, how he would be buried, who would give him his grave. Everything of the first coming was naturally and literally fulfilled. Isn't it fair to say that the second coming would be naturally and literally fulfilled as well? Amen. I think that's fair, isn't it? Well, we're going to do it that way. And if you don't like doing it that way, you should probably leave because you won't understand anything I'm saying. See? Number two. You have to take Scripture in context. The Bible says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Right? It does say that. What does it say before that? The fool saith in his heart, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. <laughs> right? So if we take the second half without the first half, who's kidding who? You can prove anything you want in Scripture if you want, if you want to take it out of context. You can't do that. You must take the context. You must take the context in which it's written. Number three, take it literally, you take it in context. Now, this is very important. You must compare Scripture with Scripture. You can't take one verse and then forget all the other verses because there are, there's translations, there's figures of speech, there's a lot of things that go in and you can get, unless you take it all and you come up with a common denominator that has no contradiction. Scripture never contradicts itself. If you have a contradiction, you don't have the answer. Pre-trib, post-trib have major contradictions. They don't have the answer. Pre-wrath, believe it or not, is a common denominator of these two views and there's no contradictions none there's not one passage of scripture that I'm worried that you're gonna pop up with that I don't I'm, not, I'm aware of it I'm not aware of, I'm not afraid of that because I don't know of any 
Because if it's a contradiction, it can't be right. I haven't gone far enough. See? So I must compare Scripture with Scripture in order to find the truth. And when I find that truth, remember, that truth stands in judgment of me. Never do I dare stand in judgment of it. I don't dare culturalize it, spiritualize it, semitize it, uh, spiritualize whatever it is, do whatever I can to get out of what it's saying. I've got to realize it means exactly what it says. That's my obligation. When God says it, he means it. And so that's the approach, that's the biblical approach that we've taken to the pre-wrath that we want to talk about today. Hmm. I'm making decent time. Let's keep going. <laughs> this first session's a little longer because I have to be done promptly, and I'm not going to overkill. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to put you to sleep. I don't think. If I do, I'll call on you. <laughs> I really will. But there's some terminology I want you to understand, and I'm not going to go into the detail here to explain it to you. This is a critical part of what we're going to be working with, and it's very important to me that you you understand this this is the seven year period that is outlined in Daniel and by the way if you study it there's no question if you compare Daniel with Revelation that it means a seven year period and when you see scripture that talks about 42 months or 1260 days it clearly tells you that it's exactly seven prophetic 360 day years okay <coughs> now Rather than to get into defense of all this, I want to give you a grid, and, and later on, before tonight, when we deal with Revelation, you're going to get a big, a big picture. But you might jot this down someplace, because it will be helpful as we go through it. Number one, Daniel 9.27 says that the seven-year period will begin with a covenant. With antichrist okay a covenant with antichrist that seven-year period will begin when the nation israel makes a covenant with a powerful figure not realizing what they have done and that will begin the seven-year period of seven of of uh, seven 360 day uh, prophetic years i know you've read a little book back there it's dealt with it i won't go over it again for the sake of time the Bible also teaches that in the middle of this period of time, the covenant will be broken by the covenant maker here. You know, right here the covenant's made. Here the covenant will be broken. And, it, and, and Antichrist will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem and demand the worship of the world. Okay? That's at the middle of the 70th week. Now God calls... Christ, and we will see this later on in Matthew, God calls, or Christ calls in his Olivet Discourse, the time from here to here, he calls this beginning birth pangs. Got to know that. Beginning birth pangs. That's what he calls it, and we will see that tonight as we study, as we study tonight um, the Olivet Discourse. We will see quickly that, um, um, I see that I'm right on here, okay. We will see tonight that, um, or this, actually the next session, we will see that God caused the first half of the 70th week beginning birth banks. The second half, and by the way, that is found, so you know, that is found, the beginning birth pangs are found in, um, if you want to ever look at it, it's found in Matthew, Matthew 24, 8. Matthew 24, 21 says that when Antichrist begins his rule, it is called the Great Tribulation. And you've got to know that that is um, persecution of elect it's what god calls it in matthew 24 31 christ calls it okay so when antichrist moves in to take the control 
of Israel at the midpoint of the seven-year period to rule the world. 2 Thessalonians 2 says he will rule the world. It begins a time of great tribulation against who? The world? The people that are sold out to him? No. It's against the people that don't take what? The mark. The 666 mark. You don't take the mark, you die. He wants to annihilate anybody that won't worship him. So we have the first half, which is called the beginning birth pangs. After the covenant's made with this powerful man. And then at the midpoint of this seven-year period, this powerful man reveals himself to Israel, who he is, moves into Jerusalem, takes the temple, desecrates the temple, and says, now you worship me or you die. And that time is called the Great Tribulation of Antichrist. Now let me go on. But God says, now follow me, God says that that time, that Great Tribulation, very important, will be cut short. Cut short. Matthew 24, verse 22, he says, you will go through a great tribulation. And even though Antichrist is given three and a half years, I will cut the great tribulation short with a sign from heaven, the sun, the moon, the stars. And it's very important that you know that. Sun, moon, stars. And that is, cuts the great tribulation short. It doesn't cut the three and a half years short. But it cuts the great tribulation short. And we'll talk a lot about that. Really, what I'm outlining for you today, right now, we will talk about the rest of the day. I just want you to understand the language. If you understand the language, then we can talk about it. See? So it's going to be cut short, and it's cut short with an event that's seen in the heavens called the sun, the moon, and the stars. And it's interestingly that all the Jews knew exactly what he was talking about. And interestingly enough, all the apostles were what? Jewish. And they knew from Joel 2, verse 30 and 31. They knew, uh, they knew from Joel 3. They knew from Isaiah. They knew from all over the Old Testament. There was going to be an event that the whole world, was, all Israel was looking for. It was called the Day of the Lord. Okay? So let me put this up for just one minute. We will see that this is the Day of the Lord, which is God's wrath against wicked. Now in case you wonder how severe that is, let me tell you how severe it is. If you look at Zephaniah 1, 14 to 18, I think we should just look at that for one minute as we're establishing this. If I can find Zephaniah. It's in the Old Testament. Third book from the end, I think. Or fourth. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Listen to what it says. Listen to this. Near is the great day of the Lord, all right? Near and coming very quickly. Listen, it means very speedily. When it comes, it comes fast. Listen, the day of the Lord. It, in it, the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day. A day of trouble and distress. A day of destruction and desolation. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the high tower corners, the, the high corner towers. And I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood will be poured out like the dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the, the day of, go, of the Lord's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy, and he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all of the inhabitants of the earth. If you go to, if you go to, um, to uh, 2 Peter 3, it says, In the last days, mockers will say, Hey, where is the promise of the coming of Christ? And it says, When they do this, it escapes their notice, that God destroyed the earth once by what? Water. 
And the second time by what? Fire. You see, that's the day of the Lord. You've been well taught. That's the day of the Lord. That's what this is talking about. But there is a sign that comes before the day of the Lord, and you must understand this. Look just at one passage so that we save time. Look at Joel. Joel 2.31. And we see it again in Joel 3. But just one verse to show you. It says, The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Okay? There is going to be a cosmic sign in the heavens. Interestingly enough, in Genesis 1, I think it's 14, Christ said, I give you, I create the sun, the moon, and the stars for one reason. For seasons, for days, and for what? Signs. What did he do before the first coming of Christ? He gave a sign in the heavens. What is he going to do before he comes a second time? He is going to give a sign in the heavens. And what it's going to be is the sun, moon, and stars. And if you study all the passages, you're going to realize that the sign for the day of the Lord is when he turns the natural lights out. When the sun goes off, the moon goes off. When the stars go out, what do we have? We have a black hole. No light. Then it says in another verse that it will be accompanied with an earthquake that will shake every nation of the world at the same time. Whatever light we've got is going to be put down because that earthquake will destroy. And whoever's sleeping will awake. And whoever's awake will know it. You see? When the sign of God's day of the Lord's wrath comes, the whole world will know it. Guaranteed. Because God is in control. And when he does it... So there is a sign, and you need to understand that the sign, we will show you where that sign takes place and why we do it. But the position that we're taking is that that sign will occur sometime, we don't know when. That's why I put a squirrely line. Sometime during the second half of the 70th week, it cuts the great tribulation short. This is the pre wrath position. We don't know the day or the hour. Only God knows. All right? Now to go on real quickly, and the only other thing I'll show you is after the 70th week is complete, there's a 30-day period, there's a 45-day period, and for the sake of room, then you have, you, have, you have the millennium, okay, which is a thousand years. Now, that is your timeline. And that's a very important timeline to remember because we will come back to that timeline again and again and again to prove the points we're trying to make. By the way, cut short, I want to say one other thing too. When it says the great tribulation will be cut short by the sun, moon, and stars, which is the day of the Lord, the sign of the day of the Lord, um, I've had scholars come to me and say, you can't say that. By cut short, it means it's limited to three and a half years. The great tribulation is limited. You see, they go to Matthew 24, Oh boy, we'll keep going. Matthew 24, and it says, 21 and 22, it says, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, and that's tied into Antichrist rule, as we'll see later on this morning. And it says, Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. They say, well, cut short simply means limited to three and a half years. So being the scholar that I am, I got my, my concordance out, and I looked up the Greek word. And the Greek word is a Greek word called kalabo, K-O-L-O-B-O. -O -O. You know what it means? Amputate. It doesn't mean you're born with a short arm. It means I had a long arm and it was cut short. I had three and a half years and whatever Satan wants to do or Antichrist wants to do, it's cut short. It's amputated. You see? All right. Now, we're ready to turn to Scripture. With that in mind, I want to cover three churches in Revelation before we start just to show you the warning of God and that will end this first session. Turn to Revelation, will you please? Revelation... 
chapter 3. If you look at the end of the book of Revelation, you're going to see in chapter 22, verse 16, that God says, or Christ says, that the book of Revelation is written for the churches. That's what it says. If you take a look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, listen what it says. It says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and what? Heeds them. My whole life I was brought up and I was told basically, don't worry about Revelation. I was. Because Revelation is not for you. Revelation 5, I'm gone. Revelation 6 to 19, that's for them. See? But I got a problem. Revelation 22 says this is written for the this is written for this is written for the church. Revelation 1 3 says, you better hear, you better read, you better hear, you better heed. You better understand. And then he systematically goes and he shows seven churches of Revelation, seven different types of churches. And all of those churches existed at that time. But as God has done often in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, often, prophetically, he will take a short-term example to prove a long-term principle. And whenever he does this, he will give you long-term language so that you can do it. He will never say, okay, don't do something today because it only applies to today, and we don't have the right to take what he says here and make a long-term application unless in the language, prophetic language, we see long-term application. You see this all the time in prophetic language. He takes a short-term issue, a punishment, and then he makes a long-term application. Seven churches of Revelation do that. Every one of them make a long-term application to the second coming of Christ. Every one of them. So you say, who are the seven churches? Very simple. Nothing tricky about it at all. They were seven literal churches at that time that had seven different types of problems. All of the problems of which will be the same kind of problems that the church will look like going into the 70th week of Daniel. And God tells us specifically and clearly exactly what's going to happen to these churches if they don't heed and hear. And at the end of each one, he says, he who has ears, let him hear. We'll see that. Every one of them. Nothing tricky about it. It only becomes tricky if you want to keep the church out of the 70th week. But if you take it for what it says, that's what it says. And we're going to see those real quickly. There are three churches. There was a faithful church, there was a dead church, and there's a compromising church. And I want to look at those three churches for a few minutes, just a few minutes, to give us a view of what the warning that we as a church body have to have. Faithful, dead, and compromising. Okay? The other thing I think you ought to know is this, and this is very important. The book of Revelation was the revelation of who? Okay, how many said Christ? Raise your hand. You are right. The Holy Spirit indwelt the writers of the New Testament. But the book of Revelation is a vision given by Christ himself, is a teaching of Christ. Now, that's important. Because when we look at the Olivet Discourse later on, which was the teaching of Christ about end times, the Olivet Discourse should say exactly the same thing as we see in Revelation, because they're the same author. If you hear me a week from now talking about prophecy, maybe a different area, you should hear the same language coming out of my mouth, the same illustrations, everything, if I'm doing this or this, and it's the same issue. So after this session, the next session, we're going to start looking at the Olivet Discourse. The teachings of Christ is what we're going to look at. You're going to see exactly the same thing in Revelation when we look at it a little bit now and we look at it tonight. All right, Revelation 2, 3. First church, 
And I won't spend a lot of time, but take a look at the Church of Philadelphia. Verse 7. Now follow with me and I'm going to show you. I'm just going to read a few things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I just want to teach you a principle. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open, says this. I'm not going to get into all that. Verse 8. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Okay? They have not denied the name of Christ. What did that mean? It meant in those days they were faithful. That means in the days of the 70th week they will not take the mark. You will see that. Let's go on. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them to come and bow down at your feet to know that I have loved you. Now let me move on to verse 10. This is the verse I want to talk about. Probably the most controversial verse in all of eschatology. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance. Perseverance, if you study the word, and it's found in Revelation 13, 10, and 14, 11, 12. Every time it talks about perseverance, it's talking about people that have not denied the name of Christ. Verse 8. He says, this is the perseverance of the saints. Verse 14. It says... Um, 14, let me just look at that real quick. Chapter 14, 11, and 12. Um, just to take a look at this. It says, Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Verse 11. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the perseverance of the saints. What? They don't receive the mark of his name. Perseverance, as used in Revelation, is they don't bow down to Antichrist. It meant something in the time of Christ, in the book of Revelation, it means they don't, they, they maintain their testimony to Christ. Because you have been faithful to me during this time, I will keep you from the hour of testing. The word testing, periosmos, is the exact word, and there's no conservative theory, uh, uh, there are no conservative scholars that would not agree that the hour of testing is the same word found in 2 Peter 2.9 is talking about the great tribulation. I won't prove that here, but there's no objection. Everybody agrees that that's what it means. What they don't agree on is what does it mean, keep you from? I will keep you from. That's not what it means. The Greek word is tereo, T-E-R-E-O, ek, E-K. Tereo means to guard within a sphere of danger. And ek means to deliver out from within. He says this, because you have persevered and you have not taken the mark and you have been true to my name, I will guard you during this sphere of danger, what? The great tribulation, and I will deliver you safely out from within. That's exactly what it says. If you take the primary interpretation. Now let's go on. We'll go on and we'll see more. He says, that, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. Then he says, verse 11, I am coming quickly. Certainly wasn't applicable to the first church. He's dealing with the, the church going into the 70th week. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have in order that no one takes your crown. The Bible says one place, that the, the time will be so, so severe that even the elect, if it were possible, would be deceived. He says, hold fast, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And then at the final verse 13, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Sum it up. We have a faithful church. During the time of great tribulation, they will not bow down to Antichrist. And God says this, because you're faithful, I will guard you during that time. I'll take care of you. Don't you worry about it. I'll take care of you because you've been faithful. You're prepared, you are alert and sober. First Thessalonians 5. I will guard you within the sphere of danger. And he says, I will deliver you safely out of it. When? We will see when the great tribulation is cut short by God's day of the Lord wrath 
When God says, I've had enough of this, he puts Noah into the ark, moves it, and destroys the earth with the flood. He puts, takes Lot and his family out of the city, and he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Those are the two illustrations to illustrate what? The day of the Lord, when God removes the faithful to destroy the wicked. Okay? You get the concept? All right. The faithful church is protected. Let's go on. The dead church, Sardis. Chapter 3, verse 1. And I'm just going to, for the sake of time, I'm only going to look at a few verses. Number 1, he says, 3, 1, it says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. A dead church. Not a compromising church. Not a faithful church. A form of godliness, but denying the truth thereof. Verse 3, remember therefore what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. If therefore you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. Do you recall earlier this morning we looked at 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2 and we showed that when Christ comes as a thief, it's not to the believers who are looking for Christ. It's to the world. The world that is saying peace and safety. Verse 3, and then sudden destruction will come upon them. But read on. I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. And that's talking about the day of the Lord. So he says, you will be so content, you will justify somehow selling out to Antichrist. Everything goes good. Peace and safety is going on to the world. And he says to you, when I come, I will come as a thief in the night. It means you've never been a believer never been a believer and you're going to go right smack dab into the flood and you're going to go right through the day of the Lord. Now let me go on. He says, you will not know what hour I will come upon you. It says, but there are a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. He says, there are a few of you, there are a few of you that are still saved in that church. He says, and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Okay? And then he has a warning here. Go on. But again, he says, you don't know what hour I will come upon you. There you see the coming of Christ. And he says, he who overcomes will be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, hear and heed. We saw in uh, the church of... Philadelphia, verse 13, he who has an ear, let him hear what the church, what he says to the churches. Be an overcomer, be an overcomer. You know what the word is for overco overcomer? How many of you jocks out there wear Nike tennis shoes? <laughs> Nike is a Greek word that the, the company took for one reason. They, want, they were last when they began and they wanted to be the best. And so they named themselves Overcomers, victorious, Nikes. A Nike is an overcomer. I'm a Nike. You're a Nike. I want to be a Nike. I want to be an overcomer. I want to face whatever I'm going to take, and I want to be a Nike. You see? A Nike is an overcomer, and every one of the churches of Revelation are told, be Nikes. Be Nikes. Be an overcomer. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says what an overcomer is. An overcomer is a person who is in Christ. A Christian. You see? So we have the faithful church. He says, no problem. I'll protect you within the sphere of danger and I'll deliver you out of it before my wrath. We have the dead church and he says, big problems. You won't even know what hits you. When my day of the Lord's wrath comes, I'm going to hit you. I'm going to hit you like a thief in the night. You'll never see it coming. And that's always the language we have for unbelievers. Now we have a third church and this one is the frightening church. This is the frightening church. Take a look at the church of Thyatira. Thyatira. My daughter keeps telling me I add an R. This is 219. It says, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, and service, and perseverance. In other words, a good church. And your deeds of late are greater than the first. You're a good church. A lot of good churches we know of. But listen what's happened. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. 
Now, that may have been the issue that then, but let me explain something. Jezebel married Ahab. Ahab was a king of the north. Jezebel brought with her all her bad doctrine concerning Baal and Ashtoreth, which was worship of the mother, you see, which revelation caused the Babylonian harlot. Anytime Satan wants to diffuse the, the issue of Christ, he will bring it on to the mother of Christ. Or he will bring it on the mother of Baal. That's called the Ashtoreth. And God hates the Ashtoreth. And Satan has always used this mother-child symbol to lead Christians astray because you shift it off of the son and you shift the glory to the mother and when you do that, you got trouble. Because Mary was a sinner like all the rest of us. And Jezebel introduced this to the church. And she was a false teacher. Now, we don't need Jezebel today. We have false teachers in the church that are leading the bond servants of Christ. It doesn't say the dead. It says my bond servants. So they're Christians. People that are sheep that are trying to follow shepherds. And a shepherd comes in and he is crooked. And he leads the bond servants astray. All right? And it says, she has led my bond service astray. So you have a faithful church, you have a dead church, and now you have a good church where you have bad teaching. Okay? Bad teaching. He says, um, listen to this. Behold, verse 22, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness. I will cast her on a bed is what it really says. And those who commit adultery with her. By the way, the adultery was false teaching. In Scripture... The adultery was anything that moved away from, from Christian teachings. You see this throughout all of Revelation. It's spiritual adultery is what it's referring to. And it says, those who commit adultery with her, and I will cast her into what? Great tribulation. Great tribulation. You want to know something? Great tribulation is used three times, only by Christ. Once in his Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, verse 21. Once it's used in Revelation 7, we'll see this later on, it says, who is this great multitude that come out of the great tribulation? And you'll know who they are when you see them. Because I'm going to be one of them. You see? It says, who is this? He says, who is this group that comes out of the great tribulation? And then here, he says to this compromising church, because you are unfaithful, you have false teachers, I'm going to purify you by throwing you right into the jaws of what Peter calls in 1 Peter 4, 1 and 1 Peter 4 of the fiery trial, which is going to separate the wheat from the tares. And you're going to see that. The warning to the compromising church. Let me just finish it and we're done. Nevertheless, oh, look at, look at this, 23, and then it says, it's verse 23, and I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. Can I tell you something? Churches are there. He says during the great tribulation, all the churches are going to know what's going on. They're not up looking down. They're in the middle of this. The good church is protected. The bad church doesn't know what's coming off. And the compromising church is going to be thrown right into the fiery trials for one reason. That through persecution, he may establish exactly who are the faithful. Let me go on real quickly. 25, verse 25, he says, Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I what? Come. That wasn't in 100 A.D. That's, that's prophetic. And then he goes on and he says, And he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, we will talk about what the end means. Christ says the day of the Lord is the end of the age. We will see this. Anytime Christ talks about the end or the end of the age, he means the day of the Lord. And we'll show that later on. Always, without exception. He says, He who keeps it until the day of the Lord, to him I will give authority all over all the nations. And then verse 29, let's read it together. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And with that, I am finished with session one.